Hmm. There we go. All right, space is vast. My, my text took a while to get here because, you know, can't go that quickly. So welcome to Making Outer Space to Play, A Cosmic History of the American Video Game by me. Uh, I am Dr. Alexander Murawski. I uh, got my PhD in informatics last year, and I will be presenting to you today some of my dissertation work. This was my dissertation examining the history of video games from a novel perspective. Uh, something quite close to my heart, space-themed games, games in a science fiction setting. So what is going on with this? There we go. So this is a panel about space-themed video games. Specifically, we're going to explore the history of video games through this novel lens. Because it turns out, over the course of the history of games, space-themed games have been pretty popular. However, what do I mean when I say space-themed games? Well, since I don't really just want to talk at you for the hour they have me scheduled, um, I want to make this a little more interactive. So I'll throw a question out to all of you as I continue to guzzle water to keep myself nice and cool. When I say space-themed game, what comes to mind? Uh, you don't have to take it from me what that is. It's a broad category. So what do you all think? What is a space-themed game for you? Yes. Okay, a game about outer space could be set in space, could be set, say, planet side, but staring up at space with some sort of cosmic theming. Yeah, what else? Yes. It involves some kind of aliens invading or attacking. Absolutely, right? So if we're us, there's got to be an, uh, an extraterrestrial other, right? An alien or something. Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's got to be something novel, maybe a bit fantastical, although the boundaries between science fiction and fantasy are squirrely, and my dissertation committee did not let me forget that. Mm -hmm. However, yeah, there's got to be some sort of fantastical other element, right? Yes? Could be a concept of other versus other. Absolutely, right? So it could be other versus other. We, humans, right, don't necessarily have to be a part of the equation. It could be something entirely novel, something imagined, perhaps still playing out um, contemporary political issues or examining moral or ethical issues from that sort of other frame. But, yeah, uh, just behind this, the same gentleman. I think it's also just all different plans. When you think about like, June 2016, it takes place on Mars, but I personally would not consider that a space game. When you think of like, a mass effect or um, Ah, okay. So we have a little bit of dissension in the ranks. We have, it's not enough for a game to be a space game if it just has planets. Obviously, we are on one. Doom is set on Mars and also briefly in hell. Um, so maybe that's not a space game. One of my committee members would agree with you wholeheartedly and be thankful that you raised that, right? Because actually, yeah, maybe, maybe it requires us to be adventuring, exploring, playing on a larger scale. Did I see another hand right at the back? Yeah, go ahead. Aha, yes. So one of the distinctions between science fiction and fantasy, some sort of advanced technology, something that doesn't strain credulity necessarily as conjuring a fireball in our hands. But if we have a doohickey that does it, well, maybe it's science fiction now. But a space game might in fact include advanced rocketry, spacecraft, laser guns, um, technology produced by those aliens or others, right? All of these things, excellent, actually, an excellent list. We're not probably going to find them all in the same game, but some combination of them might be present. And I'm not here to limit the scope here. I think if you think that a game is a space-themed game, if it means something to you that it is set in the stars or features aliens or some sort of extraterrestrial conflict or advanced technology, I think that counts. And we have seen, in fact, hopefully, there we go. Uh, is the contrast okay on this? Is this visible? I don't know how to turn the lights off at the front, but if anyone finds out at some point, maybe we should. So it turns out, in fact, that space games and love of space games is nothing new. Uh, one of the games considered to be the first video game ever was, let's hope this works, a Space War, produced at MIT in 1962 although its moniker of first is contested as with most historical firsts, but we can say it was one of them, certainly. Uh, it inspired, among other things, 
Nutting Associates 1971 Computer Space, produced by Nolan Bushnell, who would go on to found Atari. Computer Space was not particularly successful. I got an opportunity to play on a live Computer Space system at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, and it was awful. I was terrible. I died constantly. I didn't know why. I understand why people didn't play this game. Not all space games destined to succeed, although I will argue to you, I hope, successfully, that the space theme was valuable. We have Cinematronics Space War in 1977. This made use of vector beam technology, which allowed for bright phosphor color uh, eventually on the screen, which really popped in a sort of black and white space and star background. We have, of course, Space Invaders, Asteroids, Galaxian, Lunar Lander. These are games that perhaps you've heard of, popular arcade games in their own right, in their own time, and that popularity endures. Um, there are umpteen versions of Space Invaders available on any platform you can think of. However, these are just the popular ones. This, which you probably can't see, apologies, is a little word art of a hundred more space games that were produced in roughly this time frame. The space theme was everywhere. Um, obviously, it's still popular now, right? We could list off, I suspect, some of our favorite space-themed games today. But especially when the industry was young, the space theme was hot. It was the vehicle for success, at least for a while. And I'd like to show you today why that was, and why, in fact, space was so valuable as a theme to the early industry. I don't know that I'd go so far as to say the industry wouldn't exist without it. I think it would. But I will say it would be probably in a different form, if not for the space theme. So what do we have? Well, people have written about why, in fact, the space theme might be valuable. Um, this tiny text that you probably cannot read says, uh, one can easily see how a black screen could serve as an inspiration to early game developers as the perfect stand-in for outer space. Brightly displayed, vector-drawn stars looked great on those early CRT screens. Player-controlled spaceships meant no animations. Spaceships could be rendered in simple geometric shapes. Gameplay could be based primarily on physics. All of these elements were advantages to those early programmers during pre-designer, pre-artist days of game development. Or in other words, space was easy, space was cheap, so we did space. It's compelling, but maybe there's a bit more there. We have here as well, Space War, often cited as the first video game, reflected popular shooting games of the time, as well as a widespread cultural interest in space and science fiction during the mid-20th century space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. So here we have more of a cultural explanation. Space was on the brain for Americans. It's what you lived, it's what you breathed, it's what you saw on the news. And so it only made sense that it was also what you wanted to play. Okay, I think that's reasonable as well. At the time, right, those were retrospectives. We might see what people were saying at the time. If any of you can read this, I will trade you for your eyeballs. Uh, this is a, an article called The Hit Syndrome, which was published in 1980 in arcade uh, industry magazine Playmeter. And it argued that the space theme was hot, sort of in a, a slightly self-destructive, vicious cycle. The space theme was hot because hot space games had been released, and thus distributors and players wanted more of them. And so there became this rush to produce the next big hit space game. And so, consequentially, a bunch of big space games, not all of which were hits, were produced. The article goes into detail describing how this was actually problematic because it pushed out other themes. Uh, designers and developers who couldn't reach that next big hit on any particular year were in fact considered to have lost out and the industry was viewed as sort of death spiraling into outer space because that's the only game in town. So you might expect if I wrote a dissertation about this that I did a little more than simply accept those arguments. So here are my big three reasons why, and I'll go into them in detail as long as there is time left on the clock. One, uh, the space theme did in fact offer unique technological affordances to the early American video game industry. What do I mean by that? I mean that it was in fact useful, cheap, easy, effective, um, programmatically possible to produce a game in space in ways that maybe it actually wasn't with other themes at the time. Two, the space theme was actually a vehicle for organizational change, allowing for new businesses who might otherwise not have had much capital to get one of those big hits and sort of restructure, experiment with new ways of making games, distributing games, selling games, and in so doing, making the space theme that much more popular. And finally then, oh, purple's a great color here, the space theme was an effective tool for, that is, attracting players to this new medium, right? Pretty straightforward. What's a video game? Well, for many decades, that wasn't clear. And so what was an easy way to attract players? Well, use something that was popular. Uh, it probably doesn't go without saying that Star Wars Episode Four released right when the video game industry was very young. There were immediately licensed tie-ins, 
and it mattered. Star Wars games drove players, but other space games did as well. And you'll see inspirations of a Battlestar Galactica Viper here or the USS Enterprise there in other arcade games where those ships are not called out by name, but are clearly representing some existing popular space IP. So these are my reasons why. Um, I have a larger outline, which maybe I will just skip in the interest of time. Yeah, you know what? Let's skip it for the interest of time. Um, my committee needed this so that, you know, my academic chops would be intact. But I think all of you will be fine if we just go right through. So let's talk about these reasons. Reason one, space is technically feasible. And I'll be talking about this through the lens of space war. So this is the original source code for Space War version 2B, which is considered sort of the first functional, playable space war that was produced at MIT. Uh, this is what its battling spacecraft might look like, although there are so many instantiations of space war now, it proliferated through computer labs just rapidly. Um, and then after that, in about 10 years, in 1972, we see arguments about space war as this revolutionary game, uh, something that was turning hackers into mainstream uh, celebrities because there was, for example, and again, this is far too small, a space war intergalactic Olympics, which was held in 1972 that had players from across the country competing on that original game. But actually, if we look in the middle of this, there's not much that happens. Uh, there are a bunch of books that have been written about Space War more recently, but nothing is written about what happened in between Space War's release and that 72 article. And so what I'll go through here is a brief explanation of why what happened to Space War mattered for the space theme more broadly, and how talking about Space War in this in-between period helps us to understand why the technical value of space was there. So this is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's uh, Ken Olson. He founded a company called DEC, that's Digital Equipment Corporation, which produced the computer upon which Space War was coded. Very important company um, for a number of other reasons, but for now, Mr. Olson and his computers will be here with us for this purpose. Uh, this is an example of a TX0, which was put into place at MIT. All you need to know here is that the TX0 was the precursor to the computer that Space War was built on. Problem was, before the TX0, most of the computers at MIT, most of the computers that were available were big mainframe monstrosities. They were huge, they were dark colored, they were used for shadowy military things, and generally the public was either a little afraid of them or just didn't know what a computer was. However, Ken Olson had the brilliant idea of making a smaller, brightly colored, literally, he, he asked them to paint the walls this kind of friendly yellow color just so that when they showed people around, this would seem more approachable. But he said, why don't we make a computer that people can actually use, right? That your average lay person who does not have years of expertise can use. Okay, that seems reasonable. So he goes ahead and at MIT proposes, let's put in my machine to your department. Now, the traditional story says that some people come along and make space war precisely because that computing system is approachable, personable, easy to use, and that's true. However, there is a bit more to it. Um, what happens, actually, is we get the first uh, instantiation of a sort of friendly, hackery computer lab where people come in and experiment and explore, and it was in this environment that the space theme really flourished because people could come in and add a little bit here and add a little bit there, and in fact, we cannot ascribe Space War to one person, although Steve Slug Russell is generally accepted to be its creator. In fact, many people added other components. There is a star field in Space War 2B that is an actual look at the sky constellation. It's called the Expensive Planetarium. And that took quite a lot of time to code, but it is worthwhile in the game. Uh, the gravity that the star in the center uses to pull player ships in also took a while to code, was not produced by Steve Russell, was produced by someone else. And if you remember right at the beginning, uh, that line that said that physics, or gameplay could be based primarily on physics, well, it turns out physics in space costs time, processor time. And so it is not, in fact, trivial to make physics-based gameplay, but space games like Space War let people experiment with that. And we'll see why that's valuable in a moment. This is just something fun here. I was able to look at the original logs of the computer lab in which Space War was produced and played, and it's just there pretty much constantly. Usually people are working maybe for an hour on this computer. Space War is there for like three or four. So these long-term coding or gaming sessions happen really often. Um, eventually, though, this is a computer lab, so people start to get a bit frisky. Um, 
Someone complains, stop playing Space War on our machine. Why can the machine not be left in decent shape over the weekends? This is inexcusable, right? <laughs> uh, and eventually, someone complains so much that there were bugs in the machine because of perpetual Space War play that they drew a bunch of bugs crawling around inside the machine in the logbook to make their point. This was the power of the space theme. It drew people in and, you know, on the one hand, should this machine be being used for other purposes? Maybe, according to the people who run the lab. But people were actually experimenting a great deal with coding, with gameplay, with sociality around computers, in large part thanks to the fact that the space theme was so engaging. My favorite one of these, though, um, someone drew themselves telekinetically hurling the typewriter for the computer across the room after it errored out from an extensive space war play session. So space war. Everywhere at MIT, eventually proliferates elsewhere. Um, Space War also was used as a draw for visitors to the institution. So if you, no one will ever see this. The text here indicates that Space War and other games are on display prominently next to other space technology, a satellite, uh, rocket guidance systems. This was considered to be just as legitimate as those because it was real technology, real computing power being used for in essence, pretty advanced systems. Uh, it's funny, actually, you can't see it there, but um, the space war system actually pushes out, in order of importance, a system for freeze drying food and for desalinating water, starting a proud tradition of video games taking precedence over, of course, eating and drinking. So, what else do we have? Well, the interesting thing about space war is that DEC, the company whose machine it was coded upon, actually picks it up. Uh, many of you might be familiar with perhaps someone at your office, uh, maybe not now, but in the past, uninstalling the games that you have oh so secretly installed on them, right? Or at least that's the trope, right? Get those games off our systems. They're taking up valuable storage space. The client will see them. It's ruining productivity. But actually, um, DEC embraced Space War and in fact released this, a brochure called PDP-1 Computer and Space War. And Space War was in fact so technically complex that it was distributed as a test program for these computers. So when you got a new PDP-1, you did not boot up a math program, so to speak. You didn't boot up a simple display system. You booted up Space War and you played it, and if it played well, your computer was working. And it was as simple as that. So the fact that this was simultaneously a very simple game, but also a very technically complex game, meant that it was, well, useful for the computer industry as a whole. Now, there isn't time to get into it, but the history of video games intertwines quite closely with the history of computing more broadly. Uh, I am proud to say, especially here at MAGFest, that the history of video games and video games themselves have played an important role in making sure that we have the sorts of computing systems we have today. One of the reasons for that is right here. So go video games. Okay, so takeaways from this section. Space War was an important demonstration program. Um, many popular accounts of the game focus more on the people who made it. I here was more interested in looking at the ways in which the systems and infrastructure around it benefited from this very early space-themed game. When it proliferated throughout computer labs, that meant that people got to see what a computer could do for the average person. It could be a machine for fun, a machine for leisure. And that was not necessarily something that the big hulking mainframes showed very easily, which meant, again, that this space-themed game, well, it could help. It could help to bridge the gap between potential users and a technology that was actually still quite new. Okay, so another example from Reason 1, which is talking about something perhaps a bit closer to home, the arcade game Defender. Show of hands, anyone at least know of Defender or perhaps played it? Yeah, I, I mean, I figured. How many hands am I going to get at MAGFest? Probably a lot. So, if you're familiar with Defender, um, it was a hit, as many space games were. It was the first video game, although actually not really, but I'll say it was the first because the common narrative is it was the first video game produced by Williams Electronics, usually a pinball company, but a pinball company who saw that, God, video games are really popular now. We need one of those. And so they ended up hiring a few people to make one of those. And thankfully, it was a big hit. So why am I talking about Defender? Well, as you can see, this is a picture on that Playmeter magazine again of Williams president Mike Stroll with Defender and a pinball machine, right? Williams was still good at pinball, just so happens that they became good at video games as well. Video games became really big business very quickly for Williams because of this. 
They entered the coin-op market successfully thanks to a space-themed game that was deemed sexy and commercial as hell. These are lines pulled from contemporary reviews, right? This was, this was it. This was the big game to have. And during development, actually, uh, maybe a show of hands uh, for guesses. How big do you think the development team was for this game? Obviously, allow for you know early industry arcades, so it's not really a trick question. But how many people? Any guesses? Four. Okay, I've got a guess of four. And maybe two. Anyone want to jump on either of those? One, okay. Uh, it was one, actually, for about six months. And it turns out the game didn't get very far with that. It then became two, and it got near release. And then actually, I think it did become four. So you're all right. That's a wonderful thing. Um, yeah, so the exciting thing about Defender was that two men, uh, Larry, or sorry, um, two men, uh, Eugene Jarvis and Sam Dicker, were essentially given the mandate, video games are hot, please make us one. And then they were given a room and a budget, which was larger than they were expecting, and told go, essentially. And they experimented, and it was a beautiful sort of, you know, movie-style, experimental, you know, laissez-faire kind of environment. And it eventually came up with this game. Not exclusively. As I said, a few people joined later to give it a little bit of polish. But these people had never made a video game before. And so they decided, well, space is hot. It's sexy. And we could probably cut a few corners if we made a space game, because we don't have to display very much, and probably the animations don't have to be that intense. And we have this computer program that called G-Wave that makes interesting noises if you let it run too long. It bugs out, but instead of breaking, it just sort of starts going loopy, like a, a theremin on acid or something. And it turned out that those were the perfect sorts of sounds for the pops and fizzes and whirs of Defender. So if you've heard the sounds of Defender, that is the result of leaving a program running for about five hours and coming back after you get a cup of coffee and seeing what happened. Interesting things about this, the explosions of enemies are simply the way they are spawned backwards. So same animation being used, very simple. Um, the landscape, which you cannot see, uh, but is pictured up here, is a sort of realistic, I guess, looking planetscape. Um, the code for that simply says the landscape can go up or down one pixel at random every time it generates. That's it. And it turns out it makes something that looks kind of good. They did actually, the one expert they brought in was not someone who could code. They brought in a geologist to tell them what a good landscape might look like because they were <laughs> terrified that that could be a problem. But that is another benefit of the space theme. The Defender ship, I don't know, it's a spaceship, great. The aliens, I don't know, it's a alien spacecraft thing, great. The land, oh, that doesn't look like land. I can tell, I've seen land. Land doesn't look like that, right? But in space, well, you can sort of make whatever you want within reason. And that was another benefit, actually. You could just let the imagination run wild and people would buy it. There's no suspension of disbelief necessary. But, you know, pay the geologist, it's important. So that's Defender. Um, we'll go through these pretty quickly because obviously this is a longer presentation than I have time for. But actually we're gonna stick with Williams for a little bit and go to reason number two, which is talking about how the industry grew, sometimes painfully, sometimes pretty freely, thanks to the space theme's popularity. So after Defender, uh, Williams made a few other games, one of which was Sinistar. Anyone heard of Sinistar? Probably. Okay, but fewer people. That's relevant because that's sort of true of what happened in the moment. So Sinistar was made by one of the same people who was on the Defender team. This is Sam Dicker. Um, he stayed on with Williams after they offered him a contract to become a game developer with them. Except the terms of the contract were actually pretty tight. There was a non-compete, and the rest of the people who developed Defender said, uh-uh, that's not for us, and they left. And they started their own company called VidKids instead. So you have the development team of the original hit game splitting immediately, Again, a proud tradition that will continue in the video game industry. Um, with one group, uh, Sam, producing Sinistar, and the other group, Eugene Jarvis and Larry DeMar there, producing the actual successor to Defender, which is called Stargate. But as far as Williams con was concerned, Defender was huge. They won awards, operators could not buy these cabinets fast enough, and they wanted more of that. They wanted more money, they wanted more prestige for being a big player in this rapidly growing industry. And they said, okay, you've done it once, do it again, make us a, a hot video game. Thank you. Except what happened this time? Well, um, thanks to the development of Sinistar, uh, we learned that the creative process of video game development can be overmanaged. So Williams had no managers in the room, not that they had managers who knew what a video game was, when Defender was being produced. However, 
when Sinistar was being produced, they were more hands-on. They wanted to make sure it worked. They wanted to make sure development was on time. They wanted to make sure resources were being spent appropriately. And that meant crunch. Uh, what else happened? Well, we learned that creating one hit game does not guarantee a repeat of that process. Fewer of you knew what Sinistar was. It's sort of a cult classic. Um, if any of you played TF2, many of the things that Heavy shouts are things that the Sinistar, in fact, shouts at the player because it had a voice box that would intimidate and taunt people who walked past it until they played the game. Very cool concept. However, um, the game wasn't actually done because devs, there weren't many of them, but devs were crunched. And that led to, unfortunately, a subpar game that still didn't release on schedule. Now, the exciting thing is because of what happened with Sinistar, the industry learned its lesson and no game developers were crunched ever again and every game released on time complete. Uh, or at least that happened in maybe another timeline. Uh, we'll let the Nexus event play out as it will. So that's Sinistar in a nutshell. The space theme was popular, yes, but you could go too far and it wasn't enough to just have a game set in space. But what we saw with the space theme was that it was popular enough that the industry started to actually reorganize how it produced the games. And we started to see many of the same phenomenon that we see plaguing the industry today all the way back in the 1980s, simply because, well, this was a profitable industry, this was a profitable theme. And so the way games were made started to morph and change because of how popular space theme games were. Okay. Um, ooh, do we have time for Mule? Does anyone know Mule? I have a couple people who know Mule. I, I love the, 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 the soundtrack, so I think I'll just play it a little bit. Um, so Mule is an entirely different kind of game, but it's really quite delightful. Um, it was made by a company out of Arkansas called Ozark Softscape, and this was a space game of a very different sort. Uh, this was a, ooh, how do I want to describe it? Imagine semi-cooperative, semi-competitive space monopoly based on space opera fiction um, produced by someone who wanted to make educational games and teach you market economics. That's this game. And it's actually phenomenal. Um, this is Daniel Buttonberry, sort of a pioneer in the multiplayer game space. Um, came up with a lot of the things that are taken for granted today about why multiplayer games work and are fun long before anyone else figured it out. Um, she had sort of a tragic life. Uh, I don't have time to get into that now, but just know that she's phenomenal. And if you do need to Google something from this presentation, please Google this person. Phenomenal. And this was Mule. Uh, this was produced, interestingly, huh, by, oh, uh, what's that company? Produced by Ozark, but published by something called Electronic Arts. Anyone heard of that? Small company. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe a few of you have, I don't know. Um, this was actually one of the first games they published. And so Mule, with its actually pretty phenomenal gameplay um, and ability to create interesting, meaningful multiplayer gameplay on one personal computer, um, actually sort of skyrocketed EA's uh, growth and was one of the reasons why EA was able to grow as fast as it could. Unfortunately, uh, as some of you might um, have the opinion that EA is maybe a problematic actor in the game space now. But being a publisher was actually something sort of unusual. You don't make the games yourself, you just pay other people to do it, and then you market it for them and take a cut. That didn't exist before. And so once again, we see here the industry reorganizing itself, learning to do business in a different way with this company that hires another company to produce a, hit, a game, uh, a big hit game, by the way, although unfortunately for other reasons, did not sell as well as Buntonberry or anyone else wanted. Can't get into those reasons, but it was popular. And in fact, you can play versions of Mule today that have been brought forward to the 21st century. Again, I'd encourage you to at least look at it. It's really wonderful. The thing I like most about this game is that it's mostly competitive. You're all trying to build a little space colony on a planet. You're all cute alien creatures. It is an other versus other. There are no humans. Everyone is something else. And at the end of the game, uh, all of your colonists get a visit from, I think, a member of the Galactic Federation. So there's a little bit of Star Trek there in for you. And they say, ah, good job, colonists, making a workable town. However, they then rate how much you screwed each other over. And if you played this game like you might play Monopoly, you all lose. In fact, the representative says, good job, Torps. You have not created a stable colony. You've all fought amongst yourself for scraps. You all fail. You actually had to work together just enough 
to win. And if any of you were a bit too cutthroat, you take everyone else down with you. Right? Isn't that refreshing? It's, it's sort of a way to all pull together even though you're playing a game separately. EA, again, goes on to publish this, goes on to become a giant. Ozark, unfortunately, for other reasons, does not. But we have, for one of the first times, a publisher of video games coming into being. And once again, it was the space theme that helped that growth to occur. Okay. Um, ooh, is there time for this? It's also a really cool story. See, the problem with doing this is that I think all of these are a really cool story because I wrote about them. I think we have time for this. So, all right, here's maybe a, a even more of a curveball. Who has heard of Sirius Software or Space Eggs? One, two, 1.5. I'll round it, too. Um, so Sirius Software was another uh, game company who started making uh, computer software, right? So Ozark was making games for personal computers. This wasn't a thing that had really been done before because for quite a while, personal computers didn't really have the oomph, that is the processing capabilities, or the display technology that could allow them to actually render a game. There were games like Tic-Tac-Toe, um, and other sort of simpler games that were possible, but nothing quite so inventive or engaging as we might see here. But Sirius had a secret weapon, which was this gentleman here who, in the contrast, you also cannot see. This is Nasir Gabelli, uh, Iranian-American computer programmer, sort of a savant. Um, he could make the Apple especially sing like really no one else at that time. And one of the things he did was make games like this for Sirius, such as space eggs, but there were also others. And the value here is to show just how easy it was to make a space game sing when another type of game might not have on the same equipment. So this is sort of difficult to see. Space eggs is fun, by the way, because it's actually just space invaders, but um, Jerry Jewell, this guy here, said, well, I want to make games that anyone can play, right? I want to attract young children as well as older adults. And also, the only thing arcade games are good for is just chewing up your quarters as fast as possible, right? They just exist to make money. He wanted to do something different. He wanted to make a game that was just fun for the sake of fun. And so he, what they did was they reskinned Space Invaders to be kid-friendly. So instead of aliens and uh, a bunker and missiles or lasers, we have spiders and lips and wolves and my personal favorite, fuzzballs, which are worth the most points. Except running Space Invaders on a personal computer, even as powerful as the Apple II, I believe it was, was, was actually pretty difficult. No one had really done that before. And so there weren't, well, there was nothing like GitHub, right? Um, computer science program, make your students learn how to code by looking things up on Stack Overflow or GitHub, right? Because someone else has done it. But at this point in time, not so much. So what was done was actually, uh, oh, I don't know if I have it here. Uh, nope, okay. So what was done, and this is kind of fun, you cannot see it here, but each of these little sprites has a black rectangular outline around it. Oh, okay, well, great, Alex. Why does that matter at all? Wonderful, it's set in space, you can't see it, except it's set in space, so you can't see it, which meant that none of these needed to overlap with each other, which meant that the system didn't need to understand what happens when any of the sprites overlap with each other. And in fact, if you play this game or any of their other games, you can see that it's actually really messy, and some might say sloppy. Um, sprites go over each other all the time, and you know there's random black splotches here and there. But the game runs really smoothly. So smoothly, in fact, that when an Atari representative came to the computer store where this business was based and tried to sell um, some Atari personal computers, because Atari was in that business for a little bit, they were floored to see games like this running on the Apple and were concerned that like someone had ripped out the guts of one of their machines, right, one of their home consoles, and put it in an Apple to sort of cheat, right, to say, hey, we can run games on the computers that we sell you. But actually, it just worked. And it worked so well that other businesses in the industry started going for this personal computer market because, in their view, Nasir especially was able to make those machines do wonderful things. Now, again, the black splotches, the overlaps, did look sort of awkward. Um, if any of you have heard of um, Sierra Online, right, who made Mystery House and other games, Roberta Williams of the, the duo who ran that company, she was convinced that Gabelli cheated. She didn't like it, it looked shitty, and she did not want this in the industry. Except it was selling like hotcakes. And so Sierra and many other companies went for it. They decided, okay, we'll do space games, we'll try to make games with some of these tricks. And it just so turned out that these tricks were easier to do in space. If this was, say, a bowling green, right, or a football pitch, 
you better believe it would look awful with block players running around overlapping each other. Where's the ball? I don't know. Is it behind the quarterback? I, I haven't seen it for like a minute. But in space, okay, you can cheat a little bit. Space theme, useful here as well. Uh, they ended up also making a copycat of Defender. This is called Gorgon. Also fantastically successful. Defender is a complicated game, but computers, personal computers at that time could run it because of the space themes affordances. Okay. Uh, yeah, so here, right, some of the others. We all went after the market, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's get to reason three, because I think we have time. Yes, perfect, okay. We actually have a lot of time. I wish I had that driving here. However, uh, to boldly go where no players have gone before, or why it matters that we put games in space to attract players. So as I said, Star Wars produced a lot of licensed video games. Not actually one of the first, because it took forever for this game to come out for reasons I unfortunately cannot share with you, but it's a fascinating story. Atari's Star Wars arcade cabinet. Um, I think it actually released either after Empire or like around the time of Jedi, so many years after the 79 release of Episode Four. But there was still excitement, there was still buzz about Star Wars, right? Um, except Star Wars, the game, did not start off that way. Actually, Star Wars, the game, started off many years before at Atari as a game called First Person Space War. So here's a storyboard for it in 1980. They hired a guy called Jed Margolin to join the company and effectively make um, a sort of head-to-head, three-dimensional version of Space War. Because again, Space War, tremendously popular. And he said, okay, I could do that. It's going to look something like this. You're going to have a targeting reticle and in vector real time, uh, sort of like Red Baron, if anyone knows that arcade game, uh, you will basically have Red Baron head-to-head, -head, cabinet versus cabinet in space. Uh, that turned out to not be feasible for so many reasons. However, it did mean that there was a lot of development time put into this game that eventually started to become warp speed as it got a few more Star Trek elements and eventually turned into Star Wars several years later. And as you can see, we've got sort of the same elements right here. It's just we in the original Star Wars arcade, we are not in some unnamed spacecraft. We are in an X-Wing approaching the Death Star and doing the trench run, right? Very iconic, very recognizable, looks great in color vector and players ate it up. Um, they said this, feels like the movies, I feel like I'm Luke, I feel like I'm there. There was something magical about this game that actually repeats the same gameplay loops ad infinitum. Um, you can get more points, you can get more lives, but it's not necessarily the most compelling thing in the world. And it focus tested that way. When players were focus tested, they said, um, yeah, I don't know if I'd play this if it wasn't a Star Wars game, but it's a Star Wars game, so holy shit, I'm gonna play it. And that mattered. That meant that this cabinet was very successful, where otherwise the mechanics, because they really couldn't do this sort of free space style, you know, head to head battle thing that they really wanted to do. It just, the technology wasn't there, but they could do player versus environment and it worked reasonably well. So we're gonna go into a little more detail here. I'm gonna talk to you about how the space theme gained player interest by capturing imaginations, grifted player interest, because it turns out in space, it's really easy to copy someone else's game and sell it as your own. And then finally, um, gauging player interest, talking a little bit more about those focus groups. So uh, I guess I already talked a little bit about capturing imaginations, right? Star Wars was a hit movie. It was a hit franchise, and that meant that it could be a hit game as well. However, copycats. This is the game Meteors. Anyone want to guess what game this is actually? It's Asteroids, but in color, okay? And um, you know, the things you shoot are slightly differently shaped rocks, okay? Their geologist was not our geologist, fair. <laughs> um, and there are a couple other subtle differences actually. However, this is fundamentally Asteroids. And it turns out the company who made this was a company called Amusement World, who made Meteors and was taken to court because this was Asteroids, and that was unacceptable. Who won the court case? Any guesses? Yeah, it was actually. Um, Meteors won the court case fantastically. I don't read legal opinions, that's not my academic field. This was fun because essentially the judge says, you both suck. Um, your Both of your arguments were bogus, neither of you should win this case, but the law doesn't let me fail both of you, so I guess Meteors wins. Good day. And the reason for that was because the judge said that Meteors was just different enough. It wasn't precisely asteroids. There were some differences. And the argument had not been sufficiently made that asteroids was, in fact, a unique piece of IP. The judge essentially said what you all did was, well, okay, it's a space game, but there are actually a lot of those. And, you know, 
there are differences in how a space game can be produced, such that we think, I think, Meteors is more of a spiritual successor. And to be fair, right, we can all think of games that have been inspired by other games that sort of look like those other games, but maybe are a little different. So it happens, right? But one of the earliest examples, which went all the way to federal district court, I think, it went pretty high up, um, was this space game because Asteroids was so iconic and Meteors was Asteroids and yet wasn't exactly. So uh, a slightly more clear cut case, which did not involve the offending company winning, was the Hexagon Game Kiosk. And the way this worked was um, you made a set of about six arcade cabinets fit into one column, right? So you could put it in the center of your arcade. It doesn't take a lot of space. You plug it into probably one outlet, although who knows, that's a lot of amperage drawing. And you profit. And the most exciting thing was you didn't actually have to make your own game. You could break down the arcade cabinets you had, ship the, the, the motherboards, the, the control boards, to this company, which would then build them back up into a hexagon game kiosk, might reflavor the games a little bit, and then sell it. Very exciting. So um, this, you can't see it again because it's very small. This had um, Cosmic Invaders, um, which of course was Pac-Man, right? Uh, no, okay, so it was Space Invaders. So this had Cosmic Invaders and several other, other games that were clearly not new, right? Clearly just copycats. You can't see this, but I love this. So someone from, uh, I think it was Atari, wrote on here because this was a flyer that they had some of their employees sort of covertly acquire from an expo to like hunt down copycats. And this employee wrote, the only thing different about this Cosmic Invaders game is they put a plastic overlay over the screen so that the colors are different. And then they elegantly signed it, poop, exclamation mark. Companies were not happy when their games were copied, but in space, it was really easy to do that. Part of the reason for that is it was easy to make a space game in the first place, but also they were so hot that the cost of potentially getting into a lawsuit or the cost of producing some, you know, copycat knockoff was actually very low because you could stand to profit tremendously. So the industry obviously struggled with that, but some might say it flourished at the same time because there were so many more games available. Now, that causes problems later on, but it does mean that once again, the space theme is here, right in the center of this interesting organizational change. Okay. So bonus round, because I think we're getting to, yeah, about the time. I hope I have time for questions. I like questions. Um, I realized I said I wouldn't just talk at you, and then I proceeded to do precisely that. Um, put it in the course, if you don't like it. OK, so bonus round, visions of the future. Sometimes, in fact, we see all three of these reasons for space games being effective, popular, valuable, all at the same time. So this Star Wars. Uh, screenshot is actually not the end of the story of Atari's Star Wars cabinet. There was, in fact, another step involving, hmm, what does that say? ESP. Yes, in fact, involving powers of extrasensory perception. So what the heck was this? Well, to tell you this story about video games and the mind, I have to tell you a little bit about the guy who offered to make video games that can affect your mind. This is Russell Targ here and one of his associates. He worked for the CIA in the Cold War as a psychic spy, visualizing with his mind Soviet missile sites and other enemy targets that satellite technology was not yet ready to see. And this actually sort of worked sometimes. Um, okay, so I, I, so I said I, this would be interactive. Okay, how about this? How many of you believe that maybe there could be something to ESP or a sixth sense or like those gut feelings you have that kind of maybe turn out to be true or something? I'll put my hand up a little bit just because sometimes, you know, those gut feelings do seem eerily accurate. And to be fair, the U.S. government is to this day still funding projects like this. So clearly there's some sense that maybe, maybe there's something going on. But nevertheless, um, in the 70s, we have this gentleman creating images like this one of this uh, missile site, I think, in South America that look kind of the same. You know, um, it was valuable enough that NASA eventually hired him to try to create a piece of technology that would enable in their astronauts the powers of psychic projection so that they could definitively win the space race and thus have the upper hand in the Cold War. Uh, you don't have to believe me. This is the report that they submitted to NASA on their technology to engender, to awaken psychic powers in astronauts. Uh, NASA read this and uh, then sort of gently said, thank you, but no thank you. 
and uh, pushed Targ and his associates out. So this is kind of fun. Again, none of, none of the visual jokes are working because you can't see these, but this is the original report. This is the report that was submitted, um, or this is like the, the official archived version, and this was an original that I was able to find. The archived version has none of the NASA administrator's names on it who were involved with this project. So, you know, did I did I fund that? I don't think I funded that. Um, next next project, please. So, you know, it, it, they didn't sweep it under the rug, but clearly people were not pleased that the whole psychoastronaut thing didn't pan out. But Targ and his associates were not to be perturbed. So instead what they did was they said, we're gonna strike out on our own. We are going to go private. And they formed a company called Delphi Associates. You presumably get the joke. Um, and they went around to businesses, essentially trying to sell the technology they created for NASA to try to engender psychic powers in other uh, demographics of the United States public. And one that they hit upon was all of us video game players. They met an Atari representative at a fundraising dinner. Apparently the conversation went well or someone was strong-armed into something because they did in fact get a meeting at Atari HQ to show off their design. That meeting also apparently went well. Unfortunately, my best historian knows could not track down too much information about what happened there, possibly because Atari shockingly also said, yeah, thanks, but no thank you, and quietly ushered them out. Still, enough work was done that Delphi believed that they had a, an agreement for Atari to produce a version of the Star Wars cabinet that would, in the trench run, have players hear this iconic line. Iconic line. Use the force, Luke. And so players would then take their hands off. Let go. Let go of the controls. And as Luke Skywalker, complete the level with purely their powers of extrasensory perception. I'm not making this up. Uh, the idea was that you could train the American public to be psychic by having them play this arcade game. And again, apparently enough of an agreement was made that when Atari said, mm, yeah, thanks, but no thanks, uh, Delphi said, oh no, we have an agreement and sued Atari because, well, in the final game, you'll be shocked to hear Obi-Wan Kenobi does in fact tell the player to use the force. It's just you have a joystick, so you do that. But it was Delphi's idea to say, oh, Obi-Wan needs to do that. Delphi was convinced Atari had used their idea. And so they took them to court. Who won that one? Any guesses? I know, it feels like a trick question. It was Atari. The world makes sense, I promise you. Atari won. Delphi did not win. That would have been dumb. However, right, this got as far as this prototype technology being left in the Atari office for people to fiddle with because there might have been something to it. Delphi and Targ believed that it would be this space game which could reference psychic powers in an existing IP, right? The use of the force, using their proprietary technology to actually do something valuable socially and presumably argued to Atari that it would be valuable if you have the only ESP game on the market because players are going to eat that up. Turns out it probably didn't work, but I mean, the idea was interesting, right? What if you do have a novel game that has something no one else does, right? This is, this is our magic machine. It's going to make you magic. It also probably wasn't a good breakup. Um, I ordered Russell Targ's um, memoir, which is actually quite fascinating. Um, he led a very interesting life as a psychic spy. Um, and he writes in that book that, oh, no, no, we left on our own terms because Atari was full of children and it was driven and run and powered by two things, cocaine and sex. He was not happy. But nevertheless, they did start down this path. And once again, the space theme for good or for ill was involved. OK, so the space theme, I have hopefully successfully argued to you, did offer unique advantages to the early American video game industry. They were sometimes technical. They were sometimes organizational. They were sometimes cultural, right? Space mattered to people, and thus space games also mattered to people. Now, it wasn't the only game in town. So this is the actual first video game that Williams produced. Remember, I told you that Defender was supposedly the first. Actually, no. Um, they licensed some sports games because sports games for all were hot. Uh, Pong being an archetypal example of a very simple game to make, but one that was much, much more successful than computer space because it was pretty simple to pick up and pretty fun to play. So I suggest, um, possibly for me to do this work, but also just as a, a maybe a brain teaser to leave with, right? This was my 
example to you of like why space mattered. But we can also maybe think about why sports games mattered or why racing games mattered or creature games. So the next big theme after space was cute creatures. That was Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, think of, think that type of thing. Um, eventually Qbert, right? Just why is your nose shaped like that? It, I don't, it doesn't matter, it's cute, it'll sell. And it did. So we might start thinking about theme right, as being a particularly important component of video games broadly, right? We know that on a fundamental level, but from the perspective of examining just why video games and how video games become so prolific, right? We can have a, a wonderful convention that is back in person meeting to talk about them right now, in part because, well, theme, I think, matters. So I think I will let, end it there. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, please let me know if you have any questions. I think we have a few minutes left. Otherwise, please feel free to leave and do enjoy MAGFest. Uh, I think I can safely say that we're all very happy to be here. Question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the blending or the use of like familiar themes to kind of spruce up a game that might otherwise not be a space game, right? Same thing happens with Tempest. Um, if any of you know Tempest, uh, it's a very interesting game. It's sort of a top-down shooter where you sort of spider your way around a, a floating cylinder. Um, I guess you could say that that's a wormhole and maybe the ship is a ship and not a spider or a cookie. I don't know. Um, but on the cabinet, there's a big old alien, and he's looking hostile, and you better fight him by fighting his weirdly shaped friends, probably, in the game. So yeah, absolutely. Just putting a space veneer on something instantly changed it. Not uniformly. You still needed like some core gameplay to be interesting. But it is true that space was so popular that even if you didn't copy a game, you could just sort of pastiche your game right into a space-themed game. Um, I haven't looked into too many of those specifically, but it is definitely uh, an object of interest for me because I think it speaks just so profoundly to sp the space craze that was taken hold not only by players, but also the industry. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, tremendously so. That's an excellent point. Um, it is something I did study, uh, actually, as part of the dissertation. There just is not time to present on it. But yes, Flash Gordon, um, similar science fiction, actually has a very um, close uh, association with some of these early games. And I actually argue in the dissertation that um, the the change that goes on in science fiction from uh, sort of the Flash Gordon style kind of space opera, you know, um, high fantasy adventure to very kind of grim or gritty um, new age science fiction happens around the same time that science fiction video games and space themed games come into prominence such that the um, the attempts by certain science fiction authors to push back against the, the new age wave and say, hold on, but we still want zany, zany adventures in spacecraft was, I think, aided by the fact that you could see those adventures on colorful, you know, brightly lit screens. Um, so yes, those definitely played a role. The people making these games definitely did consume that media. But even closer still, I think I can justifiably argue that the space games themselves actually played a reverse role at a certain point and helped to promote certain types of science fiction to become more popular as well. But great question, because it definitely, definitely played a role. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you once again. You've been a delightful audience. Um, hopefully I'll see you around the convention hall. Um, enjoy MAGFest, and thank you so much for being here.